Okay, we're going to look at lifestyle, the Christian lifestyle. Um, and before we get going, I just want to mention a few things about anger. You know, before we get anger, before we get saved, you know, we're really governed by our anger. If we feel it, we do it. Um, we snap at kids, we snap at our spouse, we snap at, I mean, you can't say anything to me, you know, and uh, we kind of, it's, there's kind of a charge associated with that. You know, you, you feel real, ah, and you get heated up, you know, in, in the moment. Um, and Ephesians 4, uh, verses 25 to 32, it says, When you get angry, it says, uh, it says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. And then a few verses later in, in 31 or 32, it says, put away all anger from you. And the idea is that when people get angry, we do stupid stuff. We think stupid stuff and we say stupid stuff. And our attitude gets real stupid. And we just get real touchy. Have you ever noticed that when you're upset about something, somebody else can say something that's not even related to whatever you're upset about and you're at, you just kind of auto fire on them anger controlling your anger is a very very important part about this stuff that we're going to be talking about today with you know growing in a more christian lifestyle we want to submit our our out of control emotions to god god doesn't want us to live um from temper tantrum to temper tantrum so anyways just just a little side note uh, so on your sheet, the three stages of sin, um, this is how we get into sin when we're a Christian. Um, when before we're a Christian, we just kind of live in sin, you know, it's, it's, not really a, it's not really a matter of how we get into it. It's, it's, we go from passion to passion, we sleep around, we get mad at people, we do drugs, we do whatever we want. It's, it's, we're living in sin. Um, but once we get saved, there's, there's three little, little steps, and they seem small at the time, and they cause us to go into sin and these three stages are the first step is fi the fight against conscience you, you you feel up here that it's wrong I want to do this but I don't feel right about it so you're trying to argue yourself and trying to almost like convince yourself that maybe it's right or that maybe um, people are okay with you doing it or whatever you're just trying to fight against that feeling like it's wrong then the second step is seeking to justify um, it's not wrong because and so you, you start you start arguing with people and and, and you start there's more of a you're trying to move forward and you want to move forward but you still it, it, you've kind of pushed past that mental battle and now you're kind of more of at a at a battle with your will am i going to do what god says am i going to do it what, what i think am, am i going to am i going to listen to people you know and so, so you're seeking to justify and when people say something to you no it's it's not wrong that i'm doing this it's, it's not it's not wrong that i'm doing this and then you get to this third stage if you don't turn from your sin you get to this this third stage where you start living boldly in it. So, so sin is doing the wrong thing. Sin is in a, a, anything that's not what God wants us to do. So then the third step, living boldly in it. I'll do it if I want. It's my right. We, we get kind of prideful about it where, where nobody can tell us anything about it. And the thing is, this always comes very, very slow and gradual. And if we allow it to get to that third stage, it won't just be about this one issue that you're fighting, this one sin that you're fighting. You'll now spread out to other sins, and you'll just kind of live, eh, whatever. I'm messing up in this area, so I'll mess up in all of them. And it's a very dangerous place to be in. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 th says, But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Eat every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Remember as you make decisions, you know, listen to that little little still voice that says, this is wrong, don't do this. Um, you only regret it in the end. And, it, and it, is, it is a thing, you know, oh, well, I would never do that. Well... Be on your guard because those people who think that they never will fall are the people who in inevitably do fall. Anyone can fall. Anyone can fall. A pastor, a televangelist, uh, you, anybody you know, anybody can fall because sin is real slick and people are just people. Um, so on your sheet, the first one on the blank is conscience. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, conscience. Uh, so then that takes us to the second thing. Uh, before you say, think, or do, ask. 
Now, if you look on the sin real quick, all sin equally, I mean on the pay, on the PowerPoint, um, all sin equally separates us from God. A any sin that you do is worthy of death. That's hard for us to grasp, but, but that's, that's what God's word says. However, not all sin is equal. There are some sins that God says are worse than others. So um, if you were to mis, um, mislead a child, it would be better if you would have had a millstone tied around your neck and been thrown into the sea. He doesn't say that about every sin. So with that, though, remember that Christians are free from the law, you know, the Old Testament law about, you know, um, the sacrifices and all those things, but that freedom from the law does not give as an excuse for living as lawless. In other words, I am free from the law so I can be sexually immoral. I am free from the law so I can be in a um, sexual uh, relationship that is not what God wants for me. I am free from the law, therefore I don't have to uh, use my money to glorify God. I am free from the law, therefore I don't have to go to church. Freedom does not give as an excuse for living as lawless. So Christian is not about, can I do this, but should I do this? You, if you remember, we talked about this in Lesson 4 when we were talking about finances. And it's kind of a thing that comes up quite frequently with Christianity. It's not, can I do this, but should I do this? As a Christian, should I do this? We ask too much of, can I do this? Can I, as a Christian, drink? It's not the big question. The big question is, should you, as a Christian, drink? So before you say, think, or do, always ask, first off, is my motivation to glorify God? So the fill in the blank there is motivation. Will you, will this hurt or benefit my witness? If people see me doing this, will it be something that that causes people to not listen to the gospel? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 through 33, Whatever then you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. We have to live our lives not for ourselves. <clears throat> Second question, will this hurt someone? What effect will my actions have on others? I'm going to get a divorce. Okay, how will that affect other people in your life? Will it hurt someone else? Now, we know that the grand majority of times divorce is because of hardness of heart. There are obviously the exceptions, uh, spousal abuse, child endangerment, those kinds of things. But the grand majority of times it's because we just get kind of tired of dealing with someone else. And we want to move on to someone else. And God makes it absolutely clear that that makes you an adulterer. Even though you're doing it under the confines of marriage, it still makes you an adulterer. If you leave someone and get with someone else, that makes them an, adul an adulterer. So, um, will this hurt someone else? Will it hurt myself? <laughs> will it hurt... Will, will it be, is it sinful God, against God? And, and then the third question here, do I have to justify myself? So the film bank there is justify. Do I have to justify myself? Do I have to tell myself that it's okay? Do I have to lie to myself about the seriousness of this issue? Do I have to make myself feel better about doing it? See, you have to surrender your freedom for others' benefit. And if you look on your sheet there, there's a few passages there. And, Matt, uh, and Romans and Matthew and 1 Corinthians um, that talk a little bit about this. So with that being said, that takes us to obviously a very big problem in any in any of our lives, uh, the mouth. Most of us use it more than we should, a lot more than we should. <laughs> and uh, so in James, in James, James chapter 3, verse 1 through 12, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as much as we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will, will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a, is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a, a small uh, fire. So you read through, you can read through the rest of that and in, in Matthew and, and Romans. But the idea here, actually I will read the, read the Romans one. Romans 12, um, 9. 
the idea here is that the the, the tongue, the mouth, it's it's actually quite dangerous, and uh, part of controlling it is controlling our anger. As I that's why I mentioned that at the beginning of this lesson. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Really, just read through these passages that are on your sheet. Um, so much could be said. And you know what? This lesson can't last all day. So the question, the question is, when you're saying stuff, are you building up or tearing down? What's your purpose in whatever it is you're saying? When you say or do something, you shouldn't. When you say or do something, you shouldn't make amends. Excuse me. Make sure that you don't just, oh, well, you know, I whatever. I, I just have a big mouth. They have to accept me for that. No, you have to start controlling your mouth, and you need to go and apologize and make sure that their feelings aren't hurt. Always acknowledge you're wrong without making justification. What you did and said was wrong. Just own up to it and move on. Um, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. My mom, my mom taught me this when I was a kid, and sometimes when we get older, we think that we're free from the rules. Now I'm an adult, so now I can say whatever I want. If you look on social media, if you look about how people talk about with politics, people don't follow this rule very, very well. And I think that it is a good thing to remember. So that takes us once again to gossip. Gossip is very destructive. Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed a fill in the blank. Uh, that fill in the blank there under the mouth is make amends. So gossip is the next fill in the blank. Talking or listening about someone else. That's its broadest definition. We've already talked about this once throughout this class. This class, Gossip is a very big problem. Gossip splits up more, more churches than probably any other issue. You can have drunks in your church. You can have druggies in your church. You can have any race, any background, any religious background. It doesn't matter. That, no, that's gonna, but you have a gossip in your church? That's, that's a problem. See, you have all these racist people who don't want these other races in their church. You have all these, you know, traditionalists who don't want these people who don't know their traditions in their church. You have, we have all these clean and rich people who don't want the dirty, poor people in their church. But the real problem is gossip. That is a real problem. Past the nonsense racism and tradition and all that nonsense, the real problem that most churches have, if, that destroy most churches is gossip. Gossip and complaining. Not controlling the mouth and just letting it go crazy. There are worse sins <laughs> than not being able to quit alcohol. I'm not. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I mean, absolutely, you shouldn't be an alcoholic. But tell you what, gossip, gossip will do damage to yourself, to others. It's it destroys things. So before you talk, is it necessary? Is it kind and is it good? Is it necessary? Does it something that has to be said? Is it kind? Could you have said it in a better way? <laughs> and is it good? Is it something that Jesus himself would say in that way at that time? Would you like Would you like to, uh, others to share such things about you? If they were talking, would you want them to be talking about you in that same way? Because here's the thing. The people who you gossip to will gossip about you as well. And the people who listen to gossip, your gossip, will listen to gossip about you. Gossip and complaining destroy your unity with the body of Christ. If you don't want to be on the same page with God, gossip and complain. God won't speak to you. Uh, they'll just be feel like you, there's kind of a rift between you and the rest of the church. It just destroys things. So what people do is, I didn't gossip today, so why don't I feel God? You have to stop doing the thing and turn from it and seek after God. And as opportunities come by to gossip, keep passing them up and don't gossip. And uh, that's how you fix that. So that takes us to the next little... Um, Header their lifestyle, how to know what and what not to do. In there's a few passages in Proverbs that I mention on the sheet there. If you look at the header there, Proverbs 13, 20, and so on. We'll just read one of those. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. It also talks about um, how bad company corrupts. It also talks about how if you hang around with people who are short-tempered, you will become short-tempered. Um, just a lot of good things uh, in there. Um, we'll, we'll read the Romans 8.13 as well. If you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 
encourage you once again to read through those passages. Very, very, very good passages. So the first fill in the blank there on your sheet is legalism. If you do everything just right, you will be saved. There's a list of traditions and rules, and you have to dress a certain way and act a certain way, and be good enough. We don't believe that at our church. <laughs> That's nonsense. Um, obviously, there are some things that are good to do. You should come to church dressed. <laughs> you, you shouldn't come naked. No, we don't want to see that. And, uh, you know, you, you probably shouldn't, you know, drink in the church. I'm talking about alcohol. Uh, you probably shouldn't smoke in the church. Just some good ideas. You probably shouldn't do drugs inside of a church. Those kinds of things. But, you know. <laughs> Anyways, I I'm humoring myself. The same as our good works don't save us, they don't keep us saved. Somewhere along the line, we convince ourselves that we're somehow good enough. That because of our greatness, God is sparing us. See, he saved us by grace, but somewhere along the line, we had to prove ourselves and show him how... How worthy we are that we actually deserve the salvation that he gave us. But here's the thing. Nothing we ever do will make us worthy of that. Hebrews 12.2 says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's important to keep our eyes on Christ, not on ourselves. Um... Work on what God is convicting you of now while fo focusing thankfully on Christ. This is kind of two-part. First off, if God is convicting you of something, work on that. Don't try to fix everything all at once. Oh, I, I, I'm such a sinner. I'm doing... Okay, all right. Calm down. Just focus on one thing at a time. The things that, as God shows you things, work on it. Seek him. Work on self-control. Those kinds of things. And you'll notice, you'll notice that the more you work on self-control, the more it applies to all areas of your life. If you practice self-control with getting up on time and taking a shower and eating healthy and exercising, it's going to be a lot easier to stick with reading your Bible every day. If you read your Bible every day, it's going to be easier to, you know, to not gossip. <laughs> See what I mean? It's a process of living disciplined. Um, and then focus thankfully on Christ. Wherever you are, just be thankful for what Christ has done and is doing. And remember, you always veer towards what you focus on. Are you focusing on God or your sin? See, to get over sin, we need to focus on God, not the sin. Look at this thing I've done instead of look at what you have done. See the difference of, of direction? So you don't have to measure up to other people. I know sometimes it feels like you have to prove yourself. You don't. You don't have to measure up to other people. You don't have to fit someone else's standard. Christians still mess up, but they keep getting up. That's what makes a Christian. Don't give up and don't get frustrated. That right there is going to be one of your biggest struggles. Not giving up, doing it when you don't feel like doing it, and not getting frustrated. So a life of sin habits is undone day by day. See, before you were before you were saved, you had a habit of sinning. That is going to be undone day by day, little bit by little bit, little victory by little vi victory. Celebrate the victories. Celebrate the victories. Um, it's a lot easier. It's always easier to get into sin than it is to get out. It keep oh, it keeps us longer than we wanted to stay. That's just how it works. I mean, it's just like an addiction. In fact, it is an addiction. Our body is addicted to pleasure and sin. However, remember that the reward is worth the struggle. And faith is believing in what you don't see. Even though it looks like you're messing up, even though it looks like you're never going to make it, you believe that Christ has died for you and that he is making a difference in you past whatever it feels like and looks like. And you just hold on to that. I don't see that I'm different. Inside you are different and you are changing. You just got to give it time. I don't think I'll ever change. You will. Just give it time. Change happens gradually. Uh, your faith is in the work of Christ, uh, the work Christ did, not your inability to reproduce perfection. See, what I'm saying here is put your faith in Christ died for me. Don't put your faith in I did everything perfect. Christ saved me, but then I started doing everything perfect. No. And so when we're talking about living the Christian lifestyle, we're not talking about being perfect. We're talking about trusting in Christ day to day. When you're going through struggles, when you're going through times that are very difficult, death in the family, for instance, very difficult time, trusting God in little steps one at a time, little bit by little bit. Um... Your job is to seek after him, God, continually in all things. 
that's it. You seek after God. His job is already done and still in effect. He is justifying you and perfecting you. As you stand before God, he is your justification. Um, so allowing sin is disobedience, and disobedience leads to disbelief. So you, you either fight sin, or you allow it to stay, and you eventually will fall away from God. And what I mean by fall, fall away is, as I mentioned in the other lesson, uh, abandon the faith. So urgently fight and deny the fill in the blank there, urgently fight and deny, and deny the lusts of the flesh. My, my mouth is really sticking together here. Um, so we'll look at that in just a minute, but in Galatians 5.17... Galatians 5.17 For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. So the lust of what I want sets itself against the righteousness of what God wants. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. See, if we, are led, if we aren't led by the Spirit, then we're still under the law. And if we're still under the law, then that means we're going to be punished according to the law. So if you live your own way, Christ's blood does not cover you. If you live God's way, Christ's blood does cover you, and you're no longer subjected to the law. Let me kind of let me kind of explain that. And the law was given to show right and wrong, and people were judged according to that. Well, as the Bible shows, it was impossible to fulfill the law. So uh, animals had to be sacrificed as a, sacrificed as a stand-in because people sinned inevitably. They always sin. So now what happens is. Anybody who does not accept Jesus is under that law, except animal sacrifices no longer apply. They can't, they can't cover us. So you're still being judged by that law, but with no way of escape. Whereas if you put your faith in Christ, and you're led by the Spirit, and you live your life God's way, then the blood covers you, and you're no longer under the law. You're under God. But if you live in sin, you're subjecting yourself back into the law. So that brings me to what I said earlier in the lesson. Our freedom in Christ doesn't mean that we are free to live as lawless. Uh, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impure, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, having little, little groups, little country club groups, uh, having uh, temper tantrums, uh, having idols in your house. Uh, dr envying, drunkenness, carousing, and the things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So here's just some examples of uh, the lusts and passions of the flesh, overeating. We love foods. So we indulge in the flesh. We overeat. Oversleeping. It feels so good to just, you know, tune out and get away from it all, so we sleep all the time. Not, not going to work on time or not working. Doing things that feel good. Hey, you know what? I can sleep around because it feels good. Looking at pornography, lying, fighting, gossiping. These are all things that take a sin, gossip for instance, where, where the sin would be talking bad about someone, and ha launch them into overdrive. Talking bad about someone is gossip, but it's not necessarily gossiping, if you understand what I'm saying. But it, the ongoing process of always having your two cents to say about people is a, is like a um, gossip on drugs, you know. Um, so is it found in the Bible or in agreement with the Bible? This ask yourself these questions when you're when you're deciding whether or not to do something. Is it found in the Bible or is it in agreement with the Bible? There are a lot of things that are not in the Bible: marijuana, meth. Uh, <laughs> go down the list. Um, but just because it's not in the Bible doesn't mean that it, the Bible doesn't talk about it. Does that kind of make sense? Um, for instance, it says, hey, don't be lazy. Don't, don't, break, don't, don't uh, break the laws of the government. You know, those kinds of things. Um, would Jesus have done the same thing in your shoes? Whatever you do, do it to glorify God and show love to others. Whatever you do, anything you do has to be for that motivation. Am I loving God? Am I showing love to others? 
Am I glorifying God? Am I showing love to others? That has to be our motivation for what we do. We can't be our own authority on how we should and shouldn't live. So um, on your sheet there, do it to glorify God. The phone the blank is glorify. And once again, there's a lot of different different uh, passages there. Um, I'll read Ephesians. No, I encourage you, please go through and, and read these passages. We read Matthew ten thirty eight. No, let's not. Let's not. Let's just keep going. Um, it will take a lot of time. So let's go to the next section. A new creation. When you are saved, God makes you a new creation. But this is not a work of human hands. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And in John chapter 14, it says this. John chapter 14, starting in verse 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. And then in verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So the Holy Spirit wants to make you a, a reflection of God's or Christ's character. So the film of there is reflection. Um, upon salvation, the Holy Spirit begins to work in you at the moment that you're saved. And here's the thing, before you're saved, the Holy Spirit's working in you to draw you to salvation. Once you are saved, the Holy Spirit begins to work in you to remake you into the image of Christ. Um, so the film the blank there is begins, begins. Galatians talks about uh, the work that it, that God does, so we're actually going to read that. Galatians 5. Sixteen. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Um, and then go down to 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Okay, so... The gifts of the Spirit are given by the Holy Spirit itself. And these are recorded in, uh, in 1 Corinthians. And let's read 2 Timothy 1.6. 1 For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. And 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, chapters 12 and 14, both talk about um, uh, the gifts of the Spirit. Um, I don't really want to read through that because that's a whole discussion. Um, but 14.1 says, Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So if you read through chapter 12 there, it talks about the different uh, gifts and the uses of them. It talks about uh, prophecy, um, miracles, all kinds of different things. So... Um, being filled with the Spirit or baptized uh, by the Holy Spirit um, is when the Holy Spirit anoints you. So you'll be praying and you'll feel something. Um, um, it's kind of like it's hard to explain. It's like you you just know that God is touching you. I mean, it's it's hard to explain. When it happens, you know. But being filled with or baptized by the Holy Spirit is not the same as the gifts of the Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, God touches you and, and you feel this anointing and this power. Being used in the gifts of the Spirit is when God um, equips you to do a certain thing at a certain time. Uh, for instance, oftentimes in our, in our services, you'll hear uh, somebody give a, a word after worship. Um, this would be a gift of the Holy Spirit. So then there's speaking in tongues. 
Uh, speaking in tongues is the evidence of being filled. So that thing there, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues is the evidence of that. However, it is different than the gift of tongues. See, there is a spiritual gift of speaking in tongues that has an interpretation. Um, usually it's in a, it's in a known language. Um, but speaking in tongues can go either way. Um, it's the evidence of being filled. So upon salvation, everyone has a measure of the Holy Spirit in their life. Everyone. You can thereby be used by the Spirit in either the gifts or whatever. Okay. Now, as you are saved and as you seek after God, um, there will be the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Okay. We'll get to that in just a second. So there's gifts of the Holy Spirit, where the, the things that He equips you to, like prophesying. And there's being filled by the Holy Spirit, where, where you're where you're anointed for for some for um for service. So being filled is simply getting more of God in your life. Okay. The Holy Spirit does not possess us; it works and flows through us. Um, I'm not trying to make this sound like you know a Jedi or anything. It's not like that. But there is no possession. It's not like you lose control and go into a trance. And I mean, it's not like that. He does not take control and send you into a trance. When he moves, he does not go against scripture. He, anything that he says or, or impresses on your heart, um, it's it's never going to go against scripture. You're not going to have an out-of-body experience. Um, it, you're not going to be taken to a dark place, and you're not going to talk to demons or angels, to none, none of that. He will never ask you to do something that is not godly or biblical. Um, he will never say, hey, you need to go cheat on your spouse. He's not going to say those kinds of things. You are filled with the Spirit simply by persistently seeking God and asking him. And in his timing, he answers. You are used in the... We think, oh, I just come to God and I demand, fill me with the Holy Spirit, and then he's just going to cave or something. And it's not like that. You ask, you seek, and in his time, he answers. You are used in the gifts as you earnestly desire. You desire for God to use you in the gifts, and he will. And then you have to fan it to flame. Now, what does that mean? You have to keep seeking God. You have to keep desiring to be used by God. You have to keep reading his word and praying, keep growing. Um, so evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit, the evidence that, God, that the Holy Spirit has been moving, a few things. First off, overflowing fullness of the already present spirit. Um, like I said, this is something you just know when it happens. Um, empowerment for service. So the fill in the blank there, service. Um, in John 7, through 39, rather, now on the last day, the, um, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from the, his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, so empowerment for service, we feel more ready to do it. Now, what I mean by that, um, well, if you look at the end of the Gospels, none of the disciples believed that Jesus was resurrected, and then when they finally did believe, they really weren't willing to do anything about it. So then they go to um, Jerusalem, and they're just kind of sitting there, not doing much of anything. And... Then the Holy Spirit falls, and bam, they have confidence to spread the good news of the gospel. A lot of times we don't, we aren't confident to to share about God because we won't let God, you know, touch us with this Holy Spirit. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So a consecration to God. Setting yourself apart for, for, for God's service. Um, dedication to his kingdom and work. If you claim that you have had an encounter with the Holy Spirit and you're still gossiping, gossiping and complaining and just kind of sitting on your butt, not loving people, not seeking God, it, no, you didn't have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. You had a tingle of the flesh. You know, you had a, a little uh, shiver run down your spine. That's not the work of the Holy Spirit. You'll know when it's all work of the Holy Spirit. It's something inside of your your soul. It's not something that trickles down your back. Um, okay, so there's a deepened awe of God as you seek. Once again, there's a lot of passages there in your on your sheet. There's an act of love for Christ, His Word, and the lost. So that love for God will will inspire action. 
oh, I never want to, I never want to be a pastor. And then the Holy Spirit touches you and you're just like, you know what? I want people to know this. The Holy Spirit is the only way to meet your full potential in life and ministry. Trying to, well, actually I have a little sub point there. A church or a Christian trying to fulfill its ministry without the Holy Spirit is like trying to plow a field with a pebble. It's just, it's just so much harder. So much harder. The Holy Spirit will not regularly move when there is no unity. If you are gossiping and complaining, don't expect for the Holy Spirit to touch you. Even after you are filled, continually seek. God refills and refills and refills and he touches us more and he uh, uh, does an awesome work in our life. Um, so on, on your sheet there, only meet, way to meet your full potential. Potential is a fill in the blank. Um, the Holy Spirit will not regularly move. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's something that I have seen firsthand. God wants to bring you closer to himself. He wants you to seek him. The Bible talks about how God is standing at the door knocking, waiting for you to answer. And it's also, it also talks about how when you seek God, he will make himself known to you. So even after you are filled, keep seeking God. So God guides our paths. Um, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 talks about this. You know, uh, trust in the Lord. Um, don't, don't lean on your own understandings. Um, and really just a few different passages there from Proverbs. Well, we'll, we'll read one of them. Uh, Proverbs 4, 18 through 19. Where are you? Right there. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. When you when you live for your own desires, you trip over stuff and, 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 and your life is just thing after thing. And you don't know which way is up. And you don't even know why these things are happening. But when you're saved, you still go through problems. But you have direction and you have purpose and you have guidance. And the Lord is with you even when you you don't know where you're headed the whole god still guides you and then you look back and you say wow god you were really with me the whole way see god god guides our past and when, when we reject him god guides our past to to ways that are very humbling um sometimes removing blessings or whatever trying to get us to turn our attention back to him so if we go our own way we go to disaster we think we, we have our lives figured out and that we would make better decisions than just listening to God, and that's just not how it works. Seek God's kingdom and his ways, and you will have nothing to fear. The film of the blank there is fear. He changes us and our desires. You, you will still die one day. You will still go through hard times, absolutely, but... You don't have to worry about the little things. You start to see them in the perspective, oh, what if I lose my job? What if you lose your job? What if uh, this bad thing happens? What if it happens? You know, God, God will guide us through. When, if, the, if the problem comes, God will guide us through it. So he, But he also he changes us, and he does not work in us, and the person who we are isn't who we'll always be. And he changes our desires. See, now you might have a problem giving up that one sin. You know what I'm talking about. But it won't always necessarily be like that. Sin causes us to want things that are not of God. God causes us to, to want things that are good. And see, sin seems real fun and pleasing at the time. We just don't think we can... I just can't stop looking at porn. We, we genuinely don't believe that we, we are able to move past these things. But we can. Through time, through practice, through effort. Um, submission to God and his ways are the basis of true success and happiness. If you want to be happy and successful, submit yourself to God and his ways. Live his ways. You might not be successful as the world deems it, but you'll start realizing what true success is. So evil deeds produce evil deeds. Just a few last things we're talking about, the Christian lifestyle here. Evil deeds produce evil deeds. Porn leads to anger and more lusts, as well as shattered relationships. Pot leads to laziness. Alcohol leads to anger. See, 
evil deeds produce evil deeds. We think, oh, I can do this one thing, it's not going to have an effect on me. No, it's going to have an effect on you. It's going to cause other problems too. Sometimes we want to change but need to change what we allow in our lives in order to change. Well, I don't like I don't like uh, demonic activity in my house. I have a Ouija board. I have uh, Kachina dolls. I watch horror movies. I listen to music that's very immoral. But I don't want demonic activity in my house. Well, sometimes to get rid of the problem, you have to get rid of the source of the problem. And it's kind of the same thing with our lives, too. Well, I had this anger problem. Well, are you looking at pornography? Like, <laughs> it's it's something where, where it causes other things. So we want to change, but need to change what we allow in our lives in order to change. Well, I can't get off of pornography. Get rid of the smartphone. If you need to get rid of internet in your house, do that. Put uh, porn blockers on your computers. You can always go to the library to use the internet. I mean, it's not Facebook is not a life necessity. Um, so one sin leads to more sins. That's how it always works. That's how it always has worked. You can bank on it. One to serve God with a humble heart, sacrifice of yourself. That's how you do it. If you give up yourself and do things his way instead of living your life for yourself, by yourself, things will change. The Christian lifestyle is not about living how you want to live or how others want you to live, but how God wants you to live. That's the key. That is the key. So I hope that this has really helped you understand what it means to be a Christian and to live as a Christian. You know, past the traditions, past the legalism, past all the nonsense, just into seeking God. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them. And next time we will be talking about reinventing yourself.